Hey there everybody, hope your day is going well. Drew Carey with Old School Gaming here, and welcome to another Wild Wednesday. Oh, it's it's been a while, so hopefully, hopefully I can remember exactly, you know, what to do and what to say. I mean, it shouldn't be too hard, and it's still there in my mind. It's just been a while since I actually recorded one of these. So for this Wild Wednesday, apparently there's something wrong with the companion cube from the original portal. Not sure exactly what's going on, but yeah, we will see, eventually. However, first things first, I do, before I even get started, I do need to cover my own ass. So, do not harass anyone that I feature in the Wild Wednesdays with what I say. My comments and my opinions are mine and mine alone. If you wish to let someone know I've done a commentary on them, by all means, go right ahead. But, yeah, yeah, just leave... Leave all the, the, I guess, potential uh, backlash. Just leave that all on me. Don't, don't take any of it on to yourself. So, this one comes from the Game Theorists. Hmm. Interesting. So, uh, yeah, the, it's Game Theory. Portal's Companion Cube has a dark secret. Okay. Well, let's find out what this dark secret is. Here's a new cube for you to project your deranged loneliness onto. Everyone's favorite rhombohedron has a scary little secret inside of it. And no, I'm not referring to this guy's penis. Jeez, that was a, a little crude. But, I mean, how maybe that's a part of your channel. I, I honestly... I don't even know your channel or the types of videos you upload, so... Uh, well, let's get into this and see if, you know, see if you actually present a theory and then defend it or not. But first, we gotta go through what will probably be an overly long and complicated intro. Wow, a full 20 seconds. Is that really necessary to have it that damn long? And honestly, I'm probably going to have to mute that just to, once again, cover my own ass from copyright. Alright, let, let's, let's get into this. What is the dark secret of the companion cube? Hello, Internet. Welcome to Game Theory, determined to be the first show ever to talk about Portal without once mentioning cake. Wait. I just blew it, didn't I? Well, honestly, I think if you're going to make a, any kind of portal video, mentioning cake is kind of going to be a given. After all, such a little, innocent, nonchalant thing turns into such a huge ordeal. It, it's just kind of par for the course when it comes to portal. Damn it! Let's call a spade a spade, shall we? The companion cube is a box with hearts on it. And yet, despite being an inanimate object that appeared for a fraction of the first Portal game, the gaming community instantly fell in love, myself included. Without speaking, without even moving, the weighted companion cube, which by all definition should qualify as an item, quickly rose through the ranks of gaming's all-time most memorable characters. Take that, Rystar! Screw you, Chuck Rock! You're no match for my parallel of piping pal! Well, yeah, I mean, hell, you know, throughout all the different puzzles, uh, before the one with the companion cube, the boxes were just boxes. They were used to, you know, like, throw things on the buttons and solve the puzzles. And the, But then, coming to the puzzle with the companion cube, it was like, hey, this is a cube that you get to keep Throughout the entire level, throughout the entire puzzle, use, use it to solve multiple steps in the puzzle in order to reach the end. Plus, it was, you know, a lot more unique than just the regular cubes, because, I mean, hell, designed with hearts on it. And, yeah, there was never, uh, never before, never after, throughout, you know, all the way to the end of the game, a key, you know, an item, and, and hell, you even said it's an item, 
Throughout the entire game, that was the longest lasting item apart from the portal gun itself. Now, please, please tell me we're going to get into the actual theory here soon. Uh, I really do not want to have to sit through someone rambling on for 12 minutes about nothing. We grew to love this rectangular prism so much that we let it into our beds, let it chill our drinks, and let it all up in our feminine underparts. But perhaps we were too quick to let it plaster our privates. Maybe our passion for this hexahedral ombre was a little misplaced. We grew overly attached because we were alone and desperate for a friend in the testing chambers of Aperture Science. But in our haste, we didn't bother to ask questions. We didn't stop to notice the odd coincidences. What do we really know about the nature of these cubes? What black secrets are hidden behind those pink hearts? Well, that's what I'm here to find out, and possibly, you know, make a counter-argument, but so, let's get into it already. Well, first, we need to know why we love the Companion Cube so much. Back in the 1950s, when psychology was still interesting because there were no limitations on human testing, ah, uh, those were the days, Donald Hebb placed volunteers into extreme isolation, leaving them in small, empty rooms with goggles and headphones to block out sensory input. The test was supposed to last 42 days. Test subjects barely made it four, as they quickly descended into madness, unable to think clearly. So lost in deprivation that they failed basic skills tests. They started to have vivid visual and auditory hallucinations, ranging from the room filling with dogs to feeling their arm getting hit with pellets fired from a miniature imaginary rocket ship. In short, the Aperture Science testing would truly push subjects to their psychological limits as they wandered alone in room after room with no end in sight. Humans truly are social creatures, and studies have shown that lonely people are much more likely than connected people to believe that inanimate objects have emotions and intentions. Well, yeah, I mean, hell, even, you know, e even, even animals, I mean, hell, you brought up dogs, e even dogs are social creatures. If they're left alone for way too long, they become rabid. And, hell, you know, ev every living thing needs some kind of interaction. I mean, I, you know, depending on... What it is, how much interaction it needs, kind of varies. Like, plants... Eh. Pl plants don't really need that much, uh... That much... Uh, attention. Just, you know... A go to sunlight, or UV light, if you don't have access to the sun, for some reason. Maybe you're trying to grow something... Grow some strawberries inside. Hell, I don't know. But... I mean, you know, it would need interaction with water and, yeah, and air, of course. So, so, are you, are you trying to go down the path that maybe, I, I, I'm not, I'm kind of spitballing at this point, but are you trying to go down the path of saying that, oh, hey, you know, like, uh, hmm, how, how, how do I put this? That the, uh, well, it wouldn't be anyone in Aperture, it'd be GLaDOS. It turns out that GLaDOS wanted to make sure that Chell's mind didn't break throughout the testing by giving her a, you know, a, something that is different from what she's used to. So that way she can, like, s keep saying it, keep saying that, because, hmm. That, that is interesting. I, I, I don't know, we're already three minutes in. Let's see uh, if you actually ever state a theory. By the time Chell and the player reach Chamber 17, we're so ready for companionship, we'll give it to anything, including a glorified storage crate. And if you think back to the Tom Hanks movie Castaway, same thing happened there. Wilson, the bloody-faced volleyball, was the film's version of the companion cube, giving Tom Hanks someone, anyone to interact with while in isolation on the island. So basically, the companion cube is just a lovable little pile of parts that happen to be in the right time at the right place. The what reasons could we possibly have to distrust our cuddly little cube? Well, would you believe me if I said that the weight inside those weighted companion cubes came from the bodies of failed test subjects? The dead and dying predecessors of Chell. 
that is actually kind of interesting. I uh, actually had a, f a friend of mine come try to come up with the, a theory like that. That you know, like saying that's why it's weighted. It has dead bodies, but not of a child's predecessors. Not that there was any real evidence of a pred. Well, no, I guess there kind of was. Ah, uh, damn it! It's been so long since I even played Portal. It wasn't Jell given like subject number? I, I I don't remember. Well, I mean, it could be predecessors, but you know, like like I was saying, my my friend said that it was weighted with the bodies of everyone at Aperture. Who knows? Who who knows which one is? But I mean, hell, if you have some kind of evidence, please present it. Let's look at the evidence. What initially prompted this theory is the achievement you receive when you drop your companion cube into the incinerator during the first game. The name of the achievement is Fratricide, a term denoting the act of killing your brother. It seems like an odd choice of words until you consider that the thousands of test subjects captive at Aperture, the ones who used to live in the large boxes visible at the start of the second game, are just like your brethren and may just have ended up downgraded to a smaller, more disposable box okay okay so you're saying that you know i mean you actually do have a good point and you do provide you know the uh the viewing of the uh the other boxes at the beginning of portal 2 and and, and you don't you don't say it's like uh that chell had a sibling but that oh everyone there is kind of like I guess kind of like in foster care, sort of, where like all the foster kids consider each other brothers and sisters. Maybe, maybe I I don't know. I mean, hell, if you have you know like that that part is just a theory. If you have any evidence to support your theory, I'm all for it. Well, first, we know it's physically possible. Our Metroid Morph Ball episode showed that a human can fit into spaces much smaller than 0.1 cubic meters, and without even breaking into pixel measurements, it's easy to tell that a companion cube is significantly larger than any version of the Morph Ball. So physically cramming a human into a cube is absolutely possible, but is it actually what's happening? To find out, we need to examine the way GLaDOS speaks about the companion cubes. The Enrichment Center reminds you that the weighted companion cube will never threaten to stab you and, in fact, cannot speak. In the event that the weighted companion cube does speak, the Enrichment Center urges you to disregard its advice. If it could talk, and the Enrichment Center takes this opportunity to remind you that it cannot, it would tell you to go on without it because it would rather die in a fire than become a burden to you. Yes, yes, I do remember that, and that's, you know, like, it, the part of game... It's more or less just kind of a blur, except for, like, you know, the big note things. Big noteworthy things like that. Yeah, so, I mean, do you have any evidence that, you know, it's... Because, I, I mean, if someone is crammed, I mean, if someone is crammed into a box like that, they're probably not alive. So, it can't talk. And if it does start to talk, okay, that's the beginning of the zombie apocalypse, and maybe you should listen to GLaDOS and throw it in the fire. Anyway, anyway, it, you were saying that people were stuffed into the cube. Where's the evidence? Now, GLaDOS is not our friend, and is far from a reliable source of information in the first game. In fact, most of what she says is false and meant to mislead Chell. Thus, her insistence that the cubes are A, unable to talk, and B, should be ignored if they do, make it seem like the reverse is true, that they may be able to talk and that their advice should be heeded. That's certainly the experience former Aperture employee turned test subject Doug Ratman experienced. In the Portal comics, Ratman is shown to have conversations with the companion cube he carries strapped to his back, with the cube literally giving him helpful advice. In fact, the cube's advice is the one thing that keeps him alive. It even warns him against taking two pills labeled as Zyoprazidone, supposedly antipsychotic medication, except that the real medication would be named Zyoprazidone without the A. Careless typo made by Valve, or perhaps another aperture test that the cube was aware of. While under its effects, the cube no longer 
longer talks, and Ratman almost gets himself killed without its advice. Seems like GLaDOS would have a vested interest in keeping people ignoring this useful source of information. And speaking of Ratman, throughout the games you see many of his ranty scribblings on the walls. In his first chamber, you see cubes over the faces of various pictures. What many have assumed is just schizophrenic hallucinations or a fixation on the cube may be something completely different. Well, I never actually read the comics. Uh, I'm sure if I went looking, I could find them, get them myself, and then read them, but... Anyway, so... Yeah, I mean... Maybe it wasn't that the companion cube itself was talking. Maybe Doug Ratman was actually schizophrenic, but... But also a genius at the same time, so he knows that there can't be a you know, a voice from nothing. So, what he has is the companion cube, and the companion cube is kind of like his, uh, uh, like the, uh, the survival instinct in his head that is that gets suppressed from the medicine. But, well, apart from what else it's supposed to do, it also suppresses his survival instinct, but without the medicine, you know, his survival instinct, you know, just knows that, oh, hey, you know, I, I am super, super smart. There can't be a disembodied voice from nowhere. It has to come from something. Okay, it'll come from the companion cube. That way, I can survive. As for, you know, putting all the, uh, all the pictures of, you know, like, blocking out the faces with extra companion cubes... That's just more obsession than anything else. Uh, unless, Doug, uh, maybe if Doug Ratman lost the Companion Cube somewhere in the comics, then, yeah, that's definitely a massive obsession. Hmm. I, I, I don't know, I haven't read the comics. A anyway, back to you. I mean, wait, hold on. Hold on, so you... Your, your video is titled, The Companion Cube Has a Dark Secret. Okay, but if it's a dark secret, then... What? I, I mean, if, if the Companion Cube was helping Doug Ratman survive, how is there a dark secret behind it? Unless it's someone else's secret that makes the Companion Cube dark. Uh, maybe, I, I don't know, we're actually about ha well, we're a little over halfway done. You haven't provided really any evidence to what this dark secret is. Notice he hasn't placed cube images over just the faces of one gender, but both men and women. The term objectum sexual is given to people who literally fall in love with inanimate objects. Like this woman who dumped her bow and arrow fiancé Lance to literally marry the Eiffel Tower. Or this woman who married the Berlin Wall. Talk about your awkward wedding nights. Now if Ratman was indeed in love with the cube and suffering from objectum sexual, he would associate the cube with one specific sex, not plastering its picture over multiple genders. Additionally, notice that the calendar is of the Girls of Aperture Science, meaning that these pictures are of people who have worked at the company, Ratman's friends, his co-workers, people he loved and cared about. If they were dead and shoved into cubes, it would make sense that he would put cube pictures over the top of them and have hearts drawn around them. And let's not overlook the message written here either. Quote, the weighted companion cube does speak. I'm not hallucinating hallucinating you are well the thing about like you know this type of mental disorder and I, i'm not talking about what what you said the uh objectum sexual whatever no like uh you know skits uh sk paranoid schizophrenia like everyone is against you everyone's out to get you so you so if, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that that's what Doug Ratman had. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't know. But if he did have paranoid schizophrenia, then everyone else is out to get him. But, you know, like, because he's, you know, such a smart guy, he realized that he does need some type of companionship and so replaces everyone with, with a companion cube in his mind. Now, I, are you trying to say that 
Doug Ratman was the one who stuffed them in? Maybe. Do you have any evidence to this? Because, I mean, you, you just made a, a quote of some of his uh, rantings on the wall. Personally, I never really read those. Well, I read some of the more readable stuff, but, I mean, like, like that specific wall you just showed, that is completely unreadable. I just kind of went, uh, okay, a bunch of scribbles on the wall. My eyes glossed over because I was not going to read that. Okay. And we've got just barely four minutes left in. Come on, are we going to have a theory or just going to ramble on about nothing? Because, I mean, okay, so from, from what I've been able to gather so far, your theory is that the weighted companion cubes are weighted with the bodies of everyone at Aperture. Which is actually kind of, the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the theory that my one friend had back when the game was very first released. Uh, maybe? I, I don't know, it's hard to say. So let's, you know, let's get into this. Let's see what theory you've uh, got. Like, if you have any evidence to that theory, then please present it. Then in Portal 2, GLaDOS adds, I think that one was about to say, I love you. They are sentient, of course. We just have a lot of them. Again, making allusion to the fact that the cube may be able to speak, but more importantly, describing the sentience of the cubes. To be sentient means having the ability to feel and perceive. Sentient characters also display desire, will, and personality. So to say that the cube is sentient would differentiate it significantly from the likes of a turret, for example, which may at first appear to have feelings and consciousness, but are in fact just programmed to respond to various stimuli in very specific ways. A human inside a cube, meanwhile, would definitely qualify as a sentient creature. Oh well, we have warehouses full of the things. Absolutely worthless. I'm happy to get rid of them. Throughout the entirety of both games, GLaDOS only uses words like worthless and useless to describe one thing, the value of human life. Remember before when I was talking about about smelly garbage standing around being useless? That was a metaphor. I was actually talking about you. So not only has she opened up the possibility that the cubes can talk repeatedly, she refers to them using the same language she implements when talking about other human test subjects. What she's saying, and how she's saying it, gives a strong indication that the cubes may be more than meets the eye. Then there's the disintegration sound clip, when GLaDOS automatically decides that she wants to bump one of these cubes off. Listen to it a few times. Can you hear buried in amongst the metallic clang a cry for help? A last plea from someone who has just been euthanized by an AI with no regard for the waste of human life? Okay, honestly, I did listen to that a few times. I didn't really hear anything. I mean, uh, I, I totally forget. It's, it's almost like a... Like if you take something through the uh, the barrier that you're not supposed to take anything through, and then, you know, it vanishes. That's essentially, like, kind of what happened. And it's, you know, mainly just a bunch of sounds. I don't really hear any, like, voices. I just hear, like, a bunch of clanging and... It, it's essentially, like, the box itself is being atomized. Now, if... If someone is actually stuffed inside there, are they still alive? And if so, how do they stay alive? You're actually creating more questions than you are answers. And I, I, I mean, if you just say, oh, hey, that's my theory. Oh, dear gods. If you're going to have a theory, at least back it up with evidence. Even if, like, say, uh... Valve, the the creators of the game, you know they say, well, no, that's not true. If you have evidence, or if you have a theory, I mean, that's what I'm trying to say. If you have a theory, back it up with evidence. Even if the game creators say, no, that's not true. And plus, you've got what two minutes left or less. Do you have any evidence? That's the whole point of having a theory, is once you have a theory, then you provide evidence for that theory, not just speculation.
And finally, perhaps the most bizarre and unexplained coincidence of all, unlike every other item in the game, a companion cube is never faced with the threat of a material emancipation grill. The material emancipation grill, or grid depending on who you ask, is a particle barrier set up to disintegrate any unapproved contraband leaving the testing chamber. Weighted storage cubes, edgeless safety cubes, discouragement redirection cubes, and things that don't have cube in their name. Basically, any non-organic materials that are meant for that room and that room only. Why does this matter? Well, we've already discussed the companion cube's demise in the first portal, that unforgettable incinerator scene where our cube friend is in the fiery furnace before we can even get close to the particle grid. Then in Portal 2, the one and only chamber in the entire game with a broken particle field just so happens to be the same one as the one and only chamber where you can interact with a companion cube? Coincidence? Incidents? I think not. And why does it matter? Remember that organic test subjects are cleared to pass through these barriers, while cubes are not. So if these boxes did indeed contain the remains of humans lost under the guise of scientific progress, should a companion cube pass through, the exterior box would disappear, leaving only the curled up human inside. In other words, the companion cube is people. Uh, well... Uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting theory. Counterpoint, GLaDOS, I mean, wait, I mean, hell, you're bringing up the second game, too. GLaDOS just runs these tests for the sake of running tests. To see, like, oh, hey, how far can you go? What can you do? And, hell, even when, uh, Wheatley or, uh, Whitley or uh, whatever the, the hell the, uh, the other AI that takes over GLaDOS in the second game. You know, like, oh, just, oh, hey, you know, want to run more tests. That's kind of like how GLaDOS is programmed. Just run more tests and run more tests and run more tests without ever stopping. So my counterpoint is rather than your theory that, oh, hey, organic matter would be able to pass through. And any non-organic matter that is not approved to go through, so I guess, you know, yeah, the portal gun can go through. Any non-approved matter would be disintegrated by that, but any organic matter would be left alone. Okay? But, but, okay, so here here's my counter-argument, because as I was saying, GLaDOS is programmed to just run test after test after test, and this is a test of Rather than, like, completing a puzzle, how long will it take someone to throw something away that they've held on to and possibly become attached to throughout this entire chamber? And, and that's essentially a part of the test for that chamber. Hmm. I, I don't know. What, what do you think? I mean, hell, finally you said something that I can actually, you know talk about and make an argument to, so, I, I don't know, you've got what? Oh, wow, you've got less than a minute left, so, I don't know, let's see what else you got to say. So the next time an evil, dishonest AI presents you with a cute box and tells you to become friends with it, think twice. Science has no mercy. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Well, hell, that's, you know, the end. I mean, there's, you know, an end card to it, but, you know, I'm just gonna leave that out. I mean, hell, if you want to watch the original video, as always, it's uh, linked down in the description, which is either down below or on the side, depending on how you're watching this. Yeah, it definitely took you a while to get to your actual theory. I mean, and, hell, you, you did have a good point, but, I mean, but, you know, I mean, hell... The whole point of Wild Wednesday is I, you know, like, I kind of, like, sit here for a while, spitball to whatever someone else is saying, and then when they prevent, they present their, their, uh, I guess, theory on exactly why something is some way or what's actually happening, I can either agree or disagree with a counter-argument. <laughs> yeah, even, even though this is the seventh Wild Wednesday, I'm still kind of getting, getting used to the formula. And there's really not much else to say. I mean, you know, it, it was definitely a shorter theory, thankfully, given given what I have planned for Thoughtful Thursday, which 
Well, when this comes out, will be tomorrow. I don't know, depending on how long this takes to edit. I might be able to record it immediately after. I might not. I don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll see what happens. But anyway, anyway, once again, do not harass the game theorists with what I have said in this Wild Wednesday. My comments and my opinions are mine and mine alone. You can talk about whatever you want down in the comment section, whether about, you know, something I said, something the game theorists said, or just something random. I, I really don't care. And hell, you can even let the game theorists know that I've done a commentary on them. But just let me be the only one that takes the heat for whatever I say. And if you have any suggestions for a Wild Wednesday, put it in the comment section below. I'll give it a quick review and possibly do a commentary on it sometime in the future. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to smash that like button. Subscribe if you haven't. Hit that bell so you can always be notified whenever I upload another video. And of course, have fun.